Okay, welcome back. We are now at lecture 15 and we are going to talk about information theory in light of everything we've learned on the previous lecture on entropy. And uh, we are going to talk about information in a few very simple cases and we will see how it relates to, to, a, to a property that we can uh, equate to entropy in the thermodynamic sense. In fact, we will go deeper, we will discuss the fact that information is in fact a physical property. So this is this will come as a follow up on the on Maxwell's demon where we uh, discuss the fact that uh, the Maxwell's demon the paradox uh, came about from uh, the fact that that properties uh, the, of the of information is 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 being uh, erased uh, by the demon through uh, the Joule expansion. So we are going to discuss this, and uh, we also uh, will spend the last part of this screencast discussing. Uh, other um, surprising result from probabilities maybe that you have not seen before. So the first question we can ask ourselves is what, what is information? So uh, before we, we even attempt to define it, we are going to give uh, examples. In fact, in this screencast, we will not prove many uh, theorems or anything like that. We will mostly show things by example. And hopefully it will uh, open your uh, your eyes to some uh, surprising result, maybe. So let's do this. So the question we have is this. Thanksgiving is a U.S. Hol holiday and we want to know when it takes place. So we don't know. You don't know when it takes place. You have no idea. You do not remember from uh, your youth when you were Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, you are provided with three pieces of information from the outside. So let's see, let's compare three different pieces of information that we get. The first information we get is that Thanksgiving falls on a particular day of the year. The second piece of, piece of information is Thanksgiving falls in the last quarter of the year. And the last piece of information that is provided to you is Thanksgiving falls on a Thursday. So now the question you, are, you ask is that which of those statements uh, has the most information? So that's the idea. Of course, it doesn't take much thinking to, to realize what the answer is. Uh, the first statement is essentially no information other than the fact that Thanksgiving takes place, but that was part of the question. So there is no information on the first statement. The second statement, there is quite a bit more information. Now you know uh, that it happens in October, November or December of the year. So you get an interesting piece of information here that allows you to narrow down when Thanksgiving takes place. And finally, you, you are told that Thanksgiving falls on a Thursday. So that means that you have, imagine that you have 54, 52 Thursday per, per year, that gives you a, prob uh, that gives you a higher uh, probability that it happens. Uh, so let's, let's try to, to look at this from, from a quant uh, quantitative way. And uh, now we understand the intuition uh, behind the, the amount of information and let's say how we can quantify this. And of course, to do this, we will rely on uh, statistics. So let's try to quantify information and let's look at the probabilities of each statement. So if somebody tells you that Thanksgiving falls on a particular day of the year, you say, yeah, sure, I, I don't learn much because that statement has a probability of one. Now, if you look at Thanksgiving falls in the last quarter of the year, that's more interesting because that means that now you have the probability one over four, right? You have increased, uh, you have uh, uh, the probability that Thanksgiving falls in the last quarter of the year is one quarter, of course. And finally, Thanksgiving falls on a Thursday. Imagine that you have 52 Thursday per year. That means that the probability is now 52 over three under 365. Uh, so imagine that you have 365 days uh, in a non-leap year. Okay. So basically, if you were to gamble, so if you, if you were to, to gamble on the day that Thanksgiving takes place, which statement would you, would you better have? Well, of course, you want to have the state, you would rather have the statement about the Thursday because you would have essentially uh, 52 choices to go from compared to, for example, the second statement, which would be three months, which would be 
uh, many more days, around 90 days or something like that. So you, you would have much more information than, than with the last one. So it looks like there is more information in that last statement. And it would appear that the, the amount of information is related to the inverse of the probability. So basically, the more uncertain a statement is, the more information you have. So that's, that's very useful to, to, to realize this. And, and please take a moment to understand this. I, uh, on purpose, picked a different example than the one that's in the book uh, so that you can uh, maybe uh, practice a little bit with the statement in, on, in the book and in and this one. So let's try to go a little bit more. Suppose that you know two statements. Imagine that you know two statements, for example, a statement two and statement three. Clearly, uh, those two statements um, are kind of independent and the information that you get, you get much more information by knowing two of those. In fact, the probability in this case are going to multiply. You're going to, you're going to be able to multiply the probabilities. And now, in fact, you have about uh, 12 uh, or, or to, uh, let's say, let's say uh, uh, 13, in fact, for in, 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 in a 52 week uh, year, you have, um, you, have to, uh, you have 13 uh, possible days uh, to choose from if you are if you know that that Thanksgiving takes place in the last quarter of the year and it happens uh, on a Thursday, so that means that the total probability now of the of the joint st statement is in fact the product of those two probabilities. So now it starts to be interesting now, right? Because you you realize that you have additional information by having two. Uh, to two statements. So it's, it's a good time to think a little bit about this. If you are given two statements with a given, each with a given probabilities, if, the, if you are given two statements at the same time that are independent, you find that the total probability is a product. And you know in that case that the information is added. So at this point, it would appear that if you have um, two properties that multiply, like the probabilities, and then you they are related to a property like information that's added, certainly you probably have a logarithm somewhere, right? Because the logarithm of product is the sum of the logarithm. And this is, uh, this is actually uh, the motivation for, the, for the, the definition of information. And the, the definition uh, originally come from, from Claude Shannon and uh, Claude Shannon entropy is actually related, uh, uh, sorry, Claude Shannon information definition is actually related to the logarithm of the probability of a statement. So the amount of information in the statement is related to the logarithm of the probability. There is a minus sign in front because the lower the probability, uh, which is a fraction, smaller than one, so the lower the probability, uh, the, the higher the information, right? Because the logarithm of, of, a, of a probability is, is a negative number. And k is a positive constant, which which we are not going to discuss too much about, uh, but uh, it can be picked in in, in different values. Uh, in some examples below, we will use k equal one. In fact, so this is the, the definition of information, and I hope I motivated for you how the, where the logarithm c uh, comes from. Uh, and again, the minus comes from the fact that information increases when we are given a statement with low probability, right? So we can also, uh, there is also Claude Shannon entropy, and the entropy is actually the average amount of information that you get. And of course, you can calculate the average amount of information uh, by a weighted sum of the information, and of course, the weight is the probability of that statement, and you obtain uh, the, the, def uh, the definition of minus k, sum of uh, all those statements, times the probability of the statement times the logarithm of, of that probability. So this, is, uh, this works really well. And uh, let's just try to, to, to think a little bit about the, that uh, definition of, of, of entropy, of information. And uh, we see that the lower the probability, so in other words, the higher the uncertainty of a statement, if that statement is made, then you get more information. So for example, uh, to convince yourself, think about, you, you can apply this to the to, to the game of, of roulette. Uh, is it better to know the color 
of that uh, the, the, the little ball is going to, to land on or the number is going to land on. The color, the probability of the color is 1 over 2. Well, if we don't include the, the zero green uh, uh, box, uh, but let's say let's say one over two for 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 the for the scope of this discussion. Of course, the number there is actually one over the number of of uh, of possibilities. Therefore, it's much better to know the number than to know the color. So there is much more information in the statement about knowing which number the ball uh, falls on than than color. So I, I strongly recommend that you pause the the screencast at this point and and just uh, calculate this for for yourself. So let's consider a, a specific um, uh, experiment that we do in, in statistical physics very often, which is the Bernoulli trial. So if you do, if you don't remember what it is, a Bernoulli trial is a is a two outcome experiment, uh, and then we know that one of the outcome happens with probability p, and of course the other outcome happens with probability one minus p. So that's a very this is the archetypical example of a, of a, of a, of a random variable. So in that case, of course, we can calculate the entropy the same way as we did before, uh, as we as we defined before, which is the entropy is minus the sum over i of pi log pi, and uh, uh, of course the sum the well, first probability is p, the other one is one minus p, and you obtain directly that formula here, which is the entropy of a Bernoulli trial. It's it's pretty easy to calculate. So it's very useful to plot this as a function of probability, and then you see in a dashed lines the, the two contributions from the sum and in the full line you see the sum of the two. So this would be uh, basically the total um, the total entropy uh, for example per bit or in bits so calculate it's always I didn't mention this before I, it was on, the, on, the, on one of the slides that the entropy is calculated in bits. Uh, what I didn't do so clearly either, but that's because it's not it's not major. Is that uh, in this case we we plotted it as a logarithm with a with a base of two uh, before it was with the logar either the, the 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 base of ten or the natural logarithm. But all this can be actually incorporated in the k uh, constant that I mentioned before. But let's not let's not focus on that because uh, it's not going to change things too much uh, at all uh, for this discussion. So what's important is to know where is the largest entropy. In other words, where do I get most information? Well, clearly, uh, the entropy, the, the most uncertain case is when the probability p is equal to one half, right? If it's one half, uh, this is, imagine that you have a, that you have a quarter and then you try to see if it's going to land on head or tail. Uh, the most uh, the, the 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 most entropy you have is p equal one half and it's it is right at one bit in that case. Now, if if the probability is either zero or one, in other words, your outcome is certain, you have no uncertainty and therefore you have no entropy. So this is why you have go from zero to one here. Okay, those two cases, of course, are equivalent. So it's either no one for sure or no two for sure. Okay, so this could look a little bit too formal let's let's consider examples here and 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 think a little bit about about this in the example i have here in the green box so the first question is like this the first statement is this and it's these are both bernoulli trial you take a collection of physics students and uh, you wonder if they lack math with probability p or don't lack math with probability one minus p well it's very clear that most physics students I don't, don't say all, I said most, do like math. So the P, P is not quite one, but it's very close to one. So running this experiment, physics students like math with probability P and don't like math with probability one minus P, is gonna show very much to the right hand side, the right hand side of this of the plot. So you don't get much information from, from knowing this because this is already a, 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 a pretty clear uh, particularly outcome, I mean, expected outcome. Now imagine another statement. Physics students like sauteed shrimps with probability p and don't like them with probability 1 minus p. Where do you think you're going to get more information? Are you going to get more information in the second statement or the first statement? Well, it turns out there is not a very strong correlation, as far as I know, between being a physics student and, like, and liking sauteed shrimps. So it's probably 
close to say that P is probably closer to one half. Maybe not quite one half, but closer to the center of the graph. So there is much more information, in fact, on the sec in the second that you gain in the second statement that you would get in the first statement. So this is the idea of of encoding information like this, and uh, I mean quantifying information like this. So let's go back to the to the entropy as we just defined it, and we reintroduce k here so that it, it can incorporate the different bases for the logarithm, for instance, and. If you remember from the previous uh, lecture, we introduced the Gibbs expression for the thermodynamics entropy. And in fact, we found exactly the same formula. The difference was the units. Instead of talking in bits, we had, uh, we, we had the, the, the SI unit with K, which was replaced by KB, the Boltzmann constant. So it turns out that the two definition extremely close. It's just a matter of units, really, that we, that we have. KB really relates to the fact that we are talking about thermodynamics and here we are talking about bits and information. So it looks very much like Gibbs, uh, like Gibbs expression for thermodynamic entropy. And just like Gibbs expression for thermodynamic entropy, it's a measure, it's a measure of uncertainty. It's a measure of the number of microstates that can realize a given macrostate. So this is very much uh, the same uh, idea that we have in thermodynamics is about the uncertainty that we have about a given uh, system. So think a little bit again and, and pause the screencast if you need to and go back to look at the problem of 100 coins that can land in heads or, or, or tails um, in, in a bag and try to calculate this, the information that you get uh, from, from, from that kind of experiment. And you will see that it makes sense to use this kind of, of definition. And this is kind of a connection between the thermodynamics properties and, and, and the probabilities as we, as we encounter them every day. So clearly entropy and information are closely connected. And in fact, uh, Rolf Landauer uh, even made the very important claim that information is a physical quantity. So the amount of information that we get is a physical quantity. And this is the reason why we have this entropy that we found from both ends of the spectrum. One from thermodynamics that we introduced with Clausius inequality and the other one from statistical physics. So it's basically the connection between the two. So the information is physical quantity according to, to Rolf Landauer. And let's try to go a little bit further with this to, to understand this just a little bit now more. So imagine that you have n bits of information. Uh, on the right-hand side there, I believe I have eight of them. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, in fact, nine of them. Uh, and we have nine bits, so n equal nine. And then connected to a thermal reservoir temperature T. And imagine there are all the properties, all the thermodynamic properties. Doesn't matter, we don't tell them, we don't know what they are. But we, we have a system like this, and basically we have uh, each state each microstate is described by whatever the thermodynamic properties are, and also this label that we have on the right-hand side, for instance. And we know that we have two to the power n possibility, possibilities of, of consequences like this. Now, imagine now that we erase that information, so we lose the information completely. Clearly, if we lose the information, the process is irreversible. For example, if we turn all the bits to zero, we could also turn them all to one, but let's imagine we turn them all to zero. We've lost the information about the label. Okay. So in other words, all the different microstates that had the different uh, 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 bit sequence, like the one that's shown on the top, all those are now equivalent, right? Because they all have the same label zero 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 zero. Maybe I may, maybe I forgot one. So the process basically the process of 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 erasing the label, if you will, is actually the same as reducing the number of microstates by two to the power n. Okay. So, in other words, we are decreasing the uncertainty. We are increase, decreasing the number of of microstates. So, if we remember the definition of entropy in terms of microstate, we find that the entropy goes down, goes down by n k b l n two from thermodynamic standpoint, or in other words, KB ln2 per bit, a bit being one piece of information that we have. So we find that the entropy goes down. Of course, we know we cannot do that, especially 
I mean, it can never, can never go down. It can or go up or stays the same for a reversible process. But this process here is not reversible, right? L you're losing information. Uh, so therefore, the entropy of the universe has to go up by at least uh, Kb ln2, right? Per bit. Why? Because I want the total entropy of the universe to uh, uh, to be to go to stay the same or go up. In fact, it has to go up because it's an irreversible process. So we must, uh, in other words, we are we must dissipate heat in the surrounding when we do this by a, a, a value equal to Kb uh, T ln two. So um, this is very new, probably for many of you. We have never seen this before. And uh, this is probably why you are taking this course. But this provides a resolution to Maxwell Demon problem we discussed earlier. So the connection here is again this idea of microstate, and I like to think about those bits as as a as a label, basically. Now we can go a little bit further than this. What about the information that's actually stored in in a in a string of bits like this? And we're going to talk about data compression. So for that again, I'm I'm not going to make big mathematical proof. I'm just going to show you an example to try to convince you of what's happening and and try to give you uh, to to start to to develop an intuition for you about what's happening. So imagine that you have n bits like we discussed before. So you would think that you have the same information regardless of the distribution of the bits. So you would think I go, I'm going to be on the safe side. I need n bits and that's all I need, right? Well. Maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, let me try, before I go uh, beyond this, imagine that you are told that in a given city, you have uh, room num um, uh, house numbers that go from 1 to 100 at most. So it would be very safe to say, I'm going to keep space to put room uh, house number from 1 to 100 for every single street in that city. But then somebody comes to you and says, but you know, a quarter of the streets have only five or six houses on them. So I certainly don't need three digits for those. And then somebody else says, well, but you know, there is also about a third of them. They have only two digits. In fact, only the rest have more than 99, uh, sorry, more than, uh, more than, uh, than, than, than 10 streets. Uh, 10, 10 house on the on the street. So in other words, if you were to build labels that can contain three digits so that you can cover all the houses in the in the, in the city, you would actually waste material because you know that some streets will not need the three digits. Some will need only one, others will only need two. So let me try to, now that I gave you kind of this example here, let me try to go to show you a, a simpler example to, to make sure that you that, that, that you that, that we get this this better so one example that people like to talk usually is about for example the English English language uh, that there, there are collections of, of letters that we usually find together for example the termination ing is found is in, in very high probability in, in a book or in a, in, in a document so do we really need to um, to code i and n g all the time, or could we find a way to code just i and g in one in one bit, for example? So this kind of, of thing. So in other words, even though you would think there is a lot of information, in fact, there is much information can be compressed, and that's a very important thing in in data compression and also the amount of information that you have. And this is related, of course, to correlation between the different bits. Don't worry, we are not going to go too much in detail in this, but this is, this is pretty fascinating to look in, into this. In fact, all this has been has been formalized in what's called the Shannon's Noiseless Channel Coding Theorem, and we are not going to go in detail. I just want to you to be aware of this. Uh, and so we, I'm just going to introduce it in more. So I instead of talking about the street, uh, the, 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 the street address and the, the, the house numbers, let me show you an, e an easier example. Let imagine that you have four, uh, you have two bits, okay? Uh, and of course, if you have two bits of information, all the possible uh, um, realizations are listed on this slide, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1. So you are safe. If you have 100 of those 
words, if you will, you just use 200 bits and you are certain that you can encode them all. No problem, that's it. Well, hold on a second. Now, somebody tells you that the first bit has 90% chance to be zero, and the second bit has also 90% chance to be zero. In other words, the probability of finding zero, zero is 90% and 90%, so 81%. The probability to find one zero is going to be 9%, right? This, and the, the next one will be 9%. And of course, the last one will be 1% times 1%. I mean, there would be 0.1 times 0.1, so it's 1%. So this is, this is uh, so it's 10% times 10% is 1%. So we get, we get this. Okay. Now, if somebody comes and say, oh, I can, now I can do something better than using so many bits. Let's compress. Let's write now those bits in a different way. And we are going to start, each time we have a new word, we are going to start with zero so that we know when to stop if we have, where to stop if we have a, a string of, of those information. So we're going to code the first one with one bit zero, the second one with uh, two bits one zero, the third one 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 zero, and the last one 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 zero. So in each case, there's no problem. If you have a string of those, you know that each time you have a zero, you have a new word that starts, right? Now let's see what's happening. Already you see something interesting is that the most probable case, the most typical string, so zero, zero, now we only use one bit to code it. Okay? Now let's see what kind of, uh, let's see what kind of saving we can do uh, if we have, let's say, 100 of, of bits. On average, if we have 100 bits, 81 will be zero, zero, 9 will be one, zero, 9 will be zero, 1, and 1 will be 1, 1. So now what happens is the number of bits I would need to code those 100 bits if they are, if they are distributed up according to the probabilities will be 81 bits for, for the first one, uh, 18 bits for the third one, right? 9 times 2, 27 bits here because I have 9 words with 3 bits and I have only 1 word with 4 bits, so 4. So if I add all those bits that I need to encode this, those 100 bits, it actually turns out to be 130 compared to 200 bits that I would use if I were just representing my data here. So again, this is just simple numbers. It just shows with very simple example here that even though you might think that you need 200 bits to represent the 100 words, you actually only need 130. This is a very this is this is really what hap, what what is in the at the heart of of the of the the compression data compression is related of course with the amount of information that I have in all of them. So here I'm going to show you a, a little bit uh, how it works without going into much detail. Uh, it, it would require a, a, a more dedicated lecture for this, but that's that's not the goal. The goal is to give you the idea. So first we have to identify the typical sequences and, and we have to, to efficiently code them. So for example, in the previous example, the most, uh, the, the, the typical sequence was zero, zero. So you imagine that you have, uh, for, for in, in general, we say we imagine that we have data and we divide them into sequences of length n, right? Now imagine that the data points are uncorrelated. So we do not worry too much if one happens, the other one happens. We don't do that. Each of them have their own probabilities. And so the question is, what's the probability of finding a sequence x, x1, x2, and so on, all the way to xn? Remember, we have sequences of, uh, of sequences of data that are we have n of them. So the probability of that sequence is going to be obtained by p x1, x2, all the way to xn, which, since it's uncorrelated, this is the product of each probability. Right, and then the equality on the right hand side comes from, of course, from the the the, the Bernoulli sequence. We we discuss this uh, in in the one of in one of the first lectures when we discussed the uh, expectation value um, and uh, and the average uh, when we could look at uh, at the mean values and so on for the Bernoulli sequence. The point is that um, uh, this would be the probability for a typical sequence. And if I take the logarithm on the right, on the left of the of the of the probability, and then the uh, the logarithm of the of the the expression on the right hand side of this equation, I obtain an equation like this. 
that minus the logarithm of this probability is, is going to be equal simply by, by this, this information. Now, of course, we know that the logarithm of the probability is uh, related to, to, to the entropy that we, that we have. So this is going to be equal to the entropy uh, times the number of bits, of course, from the definition we had before. In other words, we find that the probability uh, is, is nothing else uh, the, of the most uh, typical sequence, right? The one sequence that we find more, more often is, is, is rated to 1 over 2 to the power and s, s being the entropy, the information, information entropy. So um, I know it goes fast, so don't, don't, don't be too worried if you do not understand every details. Uh, it's important here to understand the example I showed you before. This is just to formalize a little bit what we have. The thing is, though, is that the probability here uh, tells you that we have 2 to the power n s typical sequences, right? Because the most, the typical sequence, so the most likely, has a probability 1 over 2 to the power n s. So that means that at most we have 2 to the power n s typical sequences, right? All the others are less likely. And therefore we need, we require n times s bits to code them. So which is, of course, a, a, a big saving. And when n is large enough, this saving is almost guaranteed and we, the, the, the probability that the compression scheme will fail will become smaller because, of course, sometimes some compression uh, scheme do not do not work all the time. It has it has to to depend on the on the type of data you have. So the most important part here to 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 remember, though, I, I just to avoid confusing you, is to go back two slides ago when I explain the case of zero zero one zero zero one and one one. This is this is what you need to understand here. It kind of formalizes a little bit. Uh, what we are talking about, but I didn't go into enough details to expect uh, you to understand all the subtlety of this, and this is not the goal. This is not the objective. Now, let's, let's have a look at examples of how probabilities can be surprising. And in fact, since all the physics of thermodynamics is rooted into probabilities and statistics, uh, it's very important to be aware of them, and we are going to see them uh, a lot in the coming lectures in this course. So I just like to, to bring this to your attention at this point. So let's talk a little bit first about conditional agent probabilities. You, you may have already seen this material in a math course. So uh, for some students, this is just going to be a, a review of what you've seen before, but uh, hopefully the examples I'm going to show you uh, will, will remind you that to be very careful about these probabilities. So first of all, let me define a, a couple of things that are important. This is what we call conditional probability, uh, which is always noted with a vertical bar. P A bar B means P, what's the probability of A if you know B. So you know that B happened. So what's the probability that A happens if B happened? And then the joint probability, which would be what's the probability that A and B happen? Uh, I hope that you do realize that it is not the same thing. So in one case, we say what's the probability that one event will happen if the other, war, the, one, the other one has happened. And the other one means the probability that both would happen. I hope that you do realize that it's, these are not the same things. In fact, uh, we see uh, quite quickly, and this is written on the, on the bottom of this slide, that the probability that A and B happens will B, the probability that B happens times the probability that A happens if B happens, right? So you have, this is something that, that's pretty straightforward. If you're not convinced, you can use an example uh, to, 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 to convince yourself. And of course, the, oppo the other way is true as well. Now, imagine uh, we are going to use this equation that we just discussed, and we are going to apply it to independent events. So if two events are independent, in A and B uh, are independent, Clearly, the probability that A happens if B happens is equal to probability of A, if A and B are independent, right? Because it doesn't matter if B happened or not, since A does, does, does not depend on B. Therefore, the probability that A happens if B happens is equal to P of A. That means that now I can substitute the conditional probability P of A if B uh, in the equation on the top right of this slide. And of course, I obtain uh, that the probability that A and B happens is equal to PA times PB. And we, we know this, that when we have two independent events, the joint probability is simply 
the product of the two probabilities. But if they are not disjoint, if they are not independent, therefore we have to be careful and consider uh, the cross terms, basically. Okay, now if you have mutually exclusive events, so in other words, the events that, 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 are, that are exclusive, so if, if, if events one happens, even two did not happen, uh, we can we can do all those uh, uh, those uh, uh, calculations as well, and when we find that the probability of a new event X will be obtained from the probability that X happens if AI happens times the probability of AI, and when we can do can do all those sums, so that works really well. Now, with all this, uh, let's go one step further, and then we are going to prove what's called the uh, bias theorem. Uh, the base theorem, uh, which is like this. So we already established those two equations up there. Uh, we of course also know that P of A and B is equal to P of B and A, right? Since both of them happen uh, together. Therefore, we can write, uh, we can we can equate the two top uh, uh, equation. And then when we do that, uh, when we do that, we can actually uh, write this as the bias uh, theorem. That's obtain the probability that A happens if B happens as a function of the probability that B happens if A happens. This is a very important theorem. Uh, P A is sometimes called the prior probability because we know that A did happen. And uh, the P of A if B is basically the posterior probability. It's, the, it's, it's basically uh, we can obtain, even though we, we measure the, the three quantities on the right hand side and we infer the probability on the left hand side. So there's a reason why we call it the posterior probability. So all this should be reminders, um, but uh, the best way to, to apply this, to, to understand this is to apply them to examples and this is what we are going to do now. Uh, so imagine that you have a very large campus and you perform a COVID-19 test. And so that the probability as COVID-19 on that campus is pretty high, is 5%. And the probability that the student does not have it, of course, is 95%. So these are you either you either have COVID or you or you don't, right? This is this is the this is the the the, the idea here. Um, now we can write this mathematically: the probability that you have that you have COVID, so P of C is 0, 0, 005, it's five percent. And of course, the probability you don't is 95%. Mm. So imagine now that we test for COVID-19, and the test is actually not fully reliable reliable. It has P percent chance to be accurate. Okay. So now the question is, um, what's the probability the student has a positive test? That's the question we have. All right. So for that, we consider those different probabilities that we have. This is how we translate the fact that the test is not exact. So let's do it. We are going to consider that what is the probability that the PT if C is that, what is the probability the test is positive if the student has COVID-19. PT of C bar is what is the probability that the test is positive if the student um, does not have COVID-19. PT bar if C is the probability that the test is negative even though the student has COVID-19. And the last one is the probability that the test is negative if the student does not have um, uh, does not have COVID-19, okay, and of course we know directly what it is. We can replace that by p uh, one minus p uh, as we discussed before. And again, this is a good place probably to pause the screencast and to convince yourself of those four lines. So now, what's the probability to have a positive test? So the pro probability of to have a positive test is p of t, and for that we can calculate can use a formula that we looked so uh, two slides ago. The probability to have a positive test will be the, po the, the probability that it was a positive if it was a student at COVID-19 times the probability that the student had COVID-19 plus the probability that the test was positive if the students did not have COVID-19 times the probability that it did not have, did not have COVID-19. And we can substitute everything we've calculated before and we obtain a result like this. So if, if the... If the test is 99% accurate, which is pretty high, we calculate that the probability that the test is positive will be about 6%. So this is different from what we had before. So remember what we have here is a population of students that have 95% chance to not have COVID-19 
and we have a test that's 99% accurate. The probability that the, a test will be positive in that population will be 6%. Okay, this is the idea. The probability that the, pro that the test will be positive is 6%. So now the question really that you would like to know as a student who is going through those tests is what is what's the probability that the student has COVID-19 if tested positive? So naively you would think about well, 99%, right? No, not quite, because we also have to consider the positive test for the students who are, don't have COVID-19. And this is where we call the, the bias uh, uh, equation. So this is exactly this, this question. What P, C, if uh, bar T means, what's the probability that a student has COVID-19 if tested positive? And then we can use a formula, the bias formula, and then substitute from what we've studied before. And we find that it, if, if the test is 99% accurate, the probability that of, of a student to have COVID-19 if tested is 84%. So this is, a, this is usually a surprising result because uh, you would think that uh, if a test is very reliable, 99% is quite reliable, uh, you would think that the probability that you have COVID-19 if you are tested positive would be close to 99% as well. It's not. And the reason why it's not is because, again, they are all uh, the 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 one percent the the one percent that the test fails gives the wrong answer is compounded by the fact that many students do not have COVID nineteen so basically you have a bias towards that so this is important to calculate this and of course you can also calculate another probability as an exercise which is what's the probability that a student has COVID nineteen if it is tested he or she is tested negative so it's P C bar t bar uh, which is uh, calculated in the in this red box here and in that case it's actually very small so uh, which is actually good news right that means if, if a student is is tested uh, negative that student only has 0.05 percent chance to still have COVID-19 it's not zero percent because we do not work with any certainties but the the probability is very very small that's also the reason why it's important to test very frequently and also to test as many students as possible because that way you do uh, uh, increase the chance to get the right answer. So before I, I conclude this screencast, I'm going to go into an even more intriguing example. Uh, that's one that's usually baffles students and baffles, in fact, everybody. Uh, so we are going to do this now and it's going to be how we end this screencast. I called it the more intriguing example, and in fact, I use the example from the book, as, as I often do. So we have a person who lives in North Wales, has two, two children that are born three years apart. One of them is a boy. So imagine this. Now, the question is, what's the probability that that, that person has a daughter? So most people will say, well, it's easy. It's one, uh, one out of two right or something like that well we don't know we are going to study this and in fact another thing that we can change let's change the problem like this 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 person has two children and the taller one is a boy what's the probability that that person has a daughter okay i'm going to let you think about this for a second and then i keep going or you can pause the screencast to think more so the first thing that we have to do is what do what information what useful information do I get? Well, in fact, I don't get much much useful information at all in there. The only thing I have useful information is that person has two children, and one is a boy. So I'm talking about the first the first statement. The fact that it's the fact that we know the first, the last name and the fact that that person is from North Wales, the, per, the fact that the two two kids were born three years apart is not useful. It has actually no bearing whatsoever on what we do. This is not useful information. So this is why it's very important to read every word when you actually uh, have a multiple choice question of, or a quiz, for instance. So let's, let's try to use what we know uh, from uh, now that we, to show that our intuition, intuition is usually, uh, can be misguided when it comes to probabilities. So please be careful. Let's, let's try to study this. 
And we are going to do something very simple. We have, as you know, four possible scenarios if we have two children. The first one is boy and boy, boy and girl, girl and boy, or girl and girl. However, we know that one of the three kids, and one out of the two kids, sorry, is a boy. So the only three possibilities that we have based on the statement that we had is that we have first a boy, then another boy, uh, the, the, the young, the the, the older is a boy and younger is a boy, the older is a boy, the younger is a girl, the older is a girl, and the younger is a boy, right? We have those, those statements. What is the probability of each outcome? At the probability of each outcome, these are, equal, these are all equally likely, so one third. So now let me ask you the question knowing this. What's the probability that, that this person, so Miss Trelly, Mrs. Trelly has, what's the probability that that person has a girl? Well, the, the answer is two third. They, given the problem, the chance that this person has a girl is two third. And I'm sure that probably a number of you thought it was one half, but it's two third. Okay, for those who were not, who, who, who were not fooled yet, let me try to see if I can fool you. Now, let's suppose that we go back to the problem and we say that the youngest was a boy. If the youngest was a boy, we automatically rule out the possibility number three on this screen. Because remember, we, we ordered those pairs by age, right? The oldest first and the youngest first. Now, if we, somebody tells you that the youngest was a boy, then we have, uh, sorry, if the youngest is a boy, then we have to rule out... Um, uh, we have to we have to rule out uh, the one when the boy is the youngest, of course. So in that case, the chance that we have is one half, right? So we have we we have one one half chance that uh, that the, the the young the youngest is uh, that uh, we have the probability is, is is one half. We only have two possibilities basically uh, among all those that we have there. So this is this is quite a uh, this is quite something. This is quite something, I believe. So let's keep let's keep going with this. Um, let's do this differently. Suppose that we have the same problem, but we say that uh, the taller of the children is a boy. Now we are going to order the kids by height, and we are going to put the tallest first. So the tallest. So the, the so we have still four possibilities is boy 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 girl girl boy and girl girl but we know that the, the the tallest is a boy so that means that we have only two possibilities out of the four which is those 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 uh, two possibilities so in that case we know because it's the tallest is a boy we know that the probabilities of of having a girl is one half Okay, so this is uh, this is interesting. You would think that the being tall or not tall would have no bearing whatsoever. Well, it does have a bearing in the chance that it changes the, the probability that we it changes the, the the outcome that we have. So the impact of the information we have is very important. And in fact, this is the heart. This is here the heart of the fact that we if we can distinguish the two individual or not. So in this case, we could distinguish the kids by their height. In a few weeks, by the end of this lecture, we are going to talk about fermions and bosons. And these are not kids, of course, but these are particles. Uh, and each of them, uh, in, in, in a, for example, electrons are indistinguishable. And the fact that they are not distinguishable will change the probabilities compared to the fact that they were distinguishable. So this is very important for you to spend some time to think a little bit about, about this. So this lecture here has very little math, but there's very much thinking needed to understand what's happening. So to conclude, so we have information theory gives us kind of a, a, a important, uh, uh, important background on how to use probabilities to relate information with, with knowledge. 
The problem is that we always have partial knowledge. This is why we use, par we use probabilities. As, as you know, we always have partial knowledge of a thermodynamic system, and this is, this is exemplify, uh, exemplified by the difference between a macrostate and a microstate. We have little knowledge about microstate, and we have knowledge about the macrostate. And so those probabilities, we are trying to play with them. We are trying to, to basically tame the probabilities and, and manipulate them. I mean, uh, work with them so that we can infer information and infer properties on the physical uh, system that we are looking at. So to summarize, we introduce the information Q as minus LNP. And again, here we have the natural logarithm. So I mixed uh, uh, decimal logarithm base two and so on, but that's that's not the important thing. So long as we have a logarithm and then we pick the prefactor k uh, uh, appropriately here, it's k equal equal one. We also introduce the Shannon entropy as the average information that we have, and finally I reminded you about some important properties of uh, bias theorem and as well as probabilities and how probabilities can play trick on your mind and uh, how it's important to do, to do it right. So thank you very much, and um, I'll see you at lecture 16.